Thank you so much, worship team. Awesome job. Love worshiping with you. Good to look out and see some faces with us here today. And always so glad to have those of you who are online with us to be able to worship in spirit and virtually. We're so glad the technology allows that to happen. Today, we're going to be looking at a very challenging message, and it has to do with waiting while you're waiting. We've been having to do a lot of that lately, haven't we? If you have your Bibles, I'd love to invite you to turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. And this actually begins a series that I'll be continuing on Wednesday mornings, coming this next Wednesday morning. For those of you who are able to attend, for those of you who can't, we'll be recording these. They'll be online, and when you have some time, you can listen to them. That's what we're trying to do in this time of distancing. We're trying to provide spiritual opportunities for growth and using our website, and we'll continue to try to do that as well. So in Nehemiah chapter 1, if you're having a hard time finding that, just go to the book of Psalms and back up a few books, and you'll be right there. It's a story about answering a question in this series, what are you building in your life? What are you building, especially spiritually, especially through your testimony in your life? What are you allowing God to build in you and through you? And today we talk about while we're waiting So let's listen to God's word, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, let's always keep that in mind. He is our great and awesome God. Father, we want to praise you for your word that has been miraculously preserved through the centuries for us here today. And especially as we are dealing with this pandemic and the challenges that are the byproducts of what's going on here and around the world. Lord, there's a lot of waiting that's going on. But God, we don't want that waiting to be inactivity, a lack of involvement in your work. When we wait, we want to wait on you and to see what you have in store for us. God, we know you have a plan, and we're excited about that. And I just pray today, as we listen to you, that your Holy Spirit will speak, that you'll show us that plan and show us the steps that we need to take while we wait, so that we can be even better vessels of service for you. That's our heart's desire, God, for you to be glorified. So thank you again for your word. Thank you for the power of your spirit as he speaks to us. We pray that you will be shown clearly and that our lives will be transformed. And it's in Christ's name we pray together. Amen. Waiting is not fun, is it? Not usually. Occasionally when we wait, it's okay, but a lot of times when we wait, it's not really motivational. How about when you're on the way to work in the middle of rush hour? Up on the interstate, the traffic's thick, it's hard to move much, you're waiting. It's not really easy, is it? Or how about today, if you go to the grocery store to get some food and you want to make sure that you're not there too long... So you're hustling in, you've got your mask on, you get your food quickly, and then you have to wait in line for a long time for your groceries to be checked out so that you can be able to take them and go home. Or how about in the pandemic time, as we think about 
the waiting process with church here. So many months for not meeting at all. Now we're meeting, and I would guess we're having probably 10, 15% of the people that we normally do physically here. Most of the rest of the people are listening online. With the recent spike that's happened, people are even more concerned with the virus. And again, we're waiting. We're waiting for this virus to get gone, right? We wanted to go away and be apart from us and for people to be healthy and well again. I've heard so many people in my calls to our church members here who are saying they cannot wait to get back together in their Bible study classes, in their Sunday schools so they can have fellowship together. I know the students are going to be so excited about being able to meet again on Wednesday night. And we're just looking forward to that time. So much waiting going on. Some people have been furloughed from their jobs. They're waiting to get back. Some have lost their jobs. And they're waiting for that open door again so that they can have a place to provide for their families. Again, the waiting can be tough. In our story, we are see, seeing a lot of waiting that's going on. The Jews are waiting for some needed changes that happened about 25 centuries ago from our time here. About the year 586 B.C., the holy city of the Jews, Jerusalem, is destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. He brings in his Babylonian army, destroys a lot of the city, breaks down the walls around Jerusalem, and then takes the Jews as prisoners of war back to Babylon where they're put in prison there. Babylon today is modern-day Iraq, just so you'll know geographically where that is. So what happens while they're there? The Jews have to wait 49 years until a group of them there are allowed to go back to Jerusalem around the year 537 B.C. And then what happens to them as they get back to Jerusalem? They have to wait 21 more years before the Jewish temple is rebuilt so they can have that physical place again to worship. Again, they're having to wait. And what happens while they wait? It's not a good spiritual time. The people there just begin to blend into the environment. So you see, that's what I pray does not happen during this pandemic, is that people begin to blend in to the secular system of our world. There's so many challenging things that are going on. We've got to move away from that. And in this time of waiting, we can hear from God. And that's what we're asking him to do, to speak to us. What do the Jews do? They compromise their faith. They just blend in to the culture of what's happening there. It is not a good time. So then what happens? Another group of Jews return from Babylon to Jerusalem. This time they are led by Ezra. Today we have two books, Ezra and Nehemiah. For a period of time, they used to be one until about the third century B.C. And then they were separated and they become the two books that we know now. Some good things are beginning to happen there in Jerusalem. The city walls, though, they were destroyed. They were a mess. Nothing has happened yet to replace them. The people that are living there are discouraged. It's symbolic of the fact that they're not on top of things. It also opens them up to the possibility of foreign armies coming in with soldiers and destroying them again and taking them off again to prison. The morale is low. It's a struggling time. So what happens? The people need a leader to step up. They need somebody to take the leadership role. So what happens? A man named Hanani, as we read about in our tact, in our text, travels somewhere between 800 and 1,000 miles to find his brother, Nehemiah, to invite Nehemiah to step up, to step out, to come and help. Can you imagine how long that trip would have taken? No planes, no trains, not even a bicycle. It would have been a long, long journey. But Hanani receives the vision from God, and he decides he's going to go and find his brother. So he arrives. 
he speaks to Nehemiah to tell him all the challenging things that are going on. So what would we expect to happen right away? We would expect Nehemiah to jump up and say, okay, man, let's go. Let's rock and roll. We got to go take care of this. But he does not do that. What does the Bible say that he does? He sits down. He waits. We even see evidence of grieving. Does this strike you as being odd? With Jerusalem needing this help right away, wouldn't you think Nehemiah would just get up and say, okay, let's go, let's take care of it. It's going to be a long journey. We've got to get back. We've got to rebuild the walls. But he does not. What does he do? He waits on God to speak, to empower him, and to prepare him to do the miraculous rebuilding work. I want you to hear the following about this message today. To wait is not a waste. The key is how we wait on the Lord and how we look to him and how we allow him to work in our lives while we wait so that we'll be prepared to do his work. So, what are you waiting for today? Most all of us are waiting for something to happen. Maybe you're waiting for some people to come to meet Christ that are in your lives. Maybe family members. It could be friends or neighbors. It could be people that you've shared the gospel with along the way. It could be person X that you just met this past week and you're praying for their salvation and It's not happening yet. Are you waiting for that to occur? How about those of you who are single adults today, maybe teenagers, you're looking ahead, and you have a godly desire, which is okay, a desire to be married one day. You could perhaps even relate to Adam in the Garden of Eden when he was alone there, and he didn't have that soulmate yet, and he was hoping, and he was waiting. You may be in that stage right now, but Mr. Wright hasn't showed up yet, or Miss Wright has not quite showed up yet. You're praying, but it hasn't occurred. Maybe you're married, and you're longing for children. You would love to have that. And again, what a wonderful desire. You're ready to love and care for that little one, and it hasn't happened yet. It's something you're desiring. Maybe you're longing for those grandchildren to come along the way. Maybe you're getting ready for your future in terms of a career. And you're wanting that job opportunity to open up. You want to invest yourself into something. But again, it hasn't happened yet. Maybe you've been hit by the virus because of the economic situation. We've been hearing about that some in our faith family here at Salem. We're also hearing about health issues, obviously, going on. Challenges for people. You're praying for that healing. You heard Nick share the prayer requests that are going on, some people going through a lot of challenging times. You're walking with God. You know you're close to him. You're praying for that healing. It hasn't happened yet. And you're wondering, what's up with this long wait that I'm going through? Maybe for some of you, there's some relationship challenges that you're facing, and you're praying for that transformation, for the unity to reoccur. And it just doesn't seem to be happening yet. You've done all you can. You've done your best But those friendships, even family relationships, may not be there yet. And you're waiting for that to occur. Maybe you're going through some financial challenges. Again, perhaps because of what's happening in our economy, the changes that are occurring. And as you go towards the end of the month, you find out you're having more month than you are money. And you're praying for those needs to be met. Or maybe retirement is on the near horizon. You're wondering, is this the right time? Please keep in mind, physical retirement can occur, but spiritual retirement never does. You're always needed in the kingdom. And maybe as you physically retire, it'll open the door for a new chapter to serve like never before. Wouldn't that be great? I'm praying for renewal in our country. How about you? I am praying that the end result of this pandemic that we're facing will be that people will see Christ like never before and that we will see revival in America and across the world. 
My dream is for everyone to hear the best news about Jesus Christ. So again, about waiting, what's it a time for? It's not a wasted time. It's a time for us to grow perhaps like never before. It's not a time of inactivity. Like Nehemiah, we may need to sit down for a while, but when we hear from God, it's going to take us into intense spiritual involvement and activity. And that's what I pray will happen for every one of us who is seeking to follow Christ. God is at work. Are we ready to join him? That is our prayer today for you. So we're going to look at two major principles about the waiting time. And within each of those, try to look at some practical steps that we can take while we wait. So first of all, waiting is a time for us to be teachable. It's a time for us to listen to the Lord. In our relationship with him, do we spend more time talking to him or listening to him? I hope we're listening more than we're talking. Because here's what Nehemiah does. When he hears the news from his brother, the first part of verse 4, when I heard these things, I sat down. Nehemiah sees this as a time for spiritual evaluation. He knows there's this great need in Jerusalem. He is moved by that. But the question he's asking now is, God, are you asking me to be involved? Is this my time to stand up and get moving? And we need to ask ourselves that question about our lives as well. I want to encourage you to consider what I would call God's checklist for involvement. As we sit down, as we wait, here's what I want to invite you to do. Pick God's best for you over what is just good for you. Seek his best, not just what's good. Ask that question, God, is this your best for me? Because when we take that step, then the fruit is going to be there, and we're going to find fulfillment and excitement. How will we know? Listen to the Holy Spirit. Sit down. Be quiet. Take some time and pick God's best. Don't settle for mediocrity. Don't settle even for what's just good. Seek his best. And as you do that, I believe that it will pass the test of time. We don't know how long that time will be. But as time goes on, and as God has put something on your heart or in your mind, I believe your passion for that will become stronger. You'll even be more excited about doing that. After the first service, one of our young teenagers came by and said, I'd love to ask you to pray for me because I want to make sure that whatever is on my mind is what God has put on my mind. Is that awesome? A young lady that, like that really seeking God's direction and leadership. And as time goes on, whatever he puts on your heart or mind, it will not go away. It will just grow. And as that happens, another thing on the checklist is this. Choose conviction over emotion. You know, if you're just listening to some motivational speaker, it's easy to get excited about it or to read some book that sounds good or an article. And that can even spur us on to try to make some quick decision. But sometimes emotions are up and down. Don't just listen to your emotions. Instead, focus on God's plan. Don't be manipulated by people. Instead, be led by God, and he will speak to you individually. Waiting equals being teachable. And as we become teachable, we are going to grow like never before. So that leads us to the second major point that I want to focus on here today, and that's this. Waiting is a time for spiritual fine-tuning, another word for growth. It can be a great time to grow. What happens to Nehemiah? When he stops, he sits down, God's passion begins to work in his heart, and what does he do? In verse 4, we see that he wept. He cried. 
He is really moved. He's starting to change. He's starting to grow. And that's what God wants for each of us as well. To allow God to change our lives while we wait. And here are some great spiritual growth opportunities, but that are also going to be quite challenging. I cannot even describe to you how challenged I have been this week by studying this text, looking over it, and preparing for this message. God just showed me so many things in my life that need to be upgraded, that even need to be changed. And here is the first one, and it uses the word broken. We need to have a broken heart and spirit. We need to allow God to break us so that then he can remold us and reshape us more into the image of Jesus Christ. We read about that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, in verse 15. For this is what the high and exalted one says. And notice that's a capital O, one, that's God. Here's what God says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. And we quote him. I live in a high and holy place but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. That's those of us who are willing to be spiritually broken so that then he can refill us with his plan and power. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You know, it's one thing to know what needs to be done. Nehemiah hears that the walls around Jerusalem need to be rebuilt. But it's another thing to get prepared to get the job done. We need to make sure that we don't run out in our own strength and limited abilities. But instead, we wait upon the plan and especially the power of God. God begins to stir up our heart ahead of time. And then there is a time right after the stirring before we go. That's the preparation time. That is the time that we go through our spiritual boot camp where God builds us up, where he empowers us and then sends us out. And a major part of that process is to build character. Not to become a character, but to have the character of God in us. And then he will get the glory. As we do that, we're more dependent on God. And then he is seen rather than us. As I was thinking about this, an example of transformation I thought of was the Apostle Peter. Sometimes we forget about some of the things he did before he was broken. Do you remember that? Do you remember the time that he, as the man pulled out a sword and cut off the ear of the servant of Malchus? Why did he cut off his ear? Because he missed cutting off his head. Peter was trying to kill him. Acting on his own, jumping out before he should have. He is prideful. There are times he is very stubborn along the way. And then finally, after he denies knowing Jesus in a trifold way, three different times denying that he even knew Jesus, he is finally broken, spiritually broken. Jesus renews him, restores him, and then Peter goes out and becomes one of the greatest Christian servants and leaders of all time when he was finally broken. And that's what happens with Nehemiah. His heart is broken. And as a result of that, he's being prepared to have the power of God. I want you to see this statement that applies to all of us here today as we think about being spiritually broken. The end result of being spiritually bruised and or crushed or broken is to come to the point where we have a complete sense of dependency on God. We are leaning totally on him and him alone. The question we need to ask ourselves today is this, am I there yet? Have I been broken Am I allowing God to reshape and remold me? How do we know when we're truly walking with God in the Spirit? You see, many times when we think about brokenness, 
we think about something that happens when something goes wrong in our lives. And then we're reshaped and remolded. And that's great. But the true spiritual brokenness we need to experience needs to occur when things are good with us. When things that are well with us. But like Nehemiah, our heart breaks for the hurt and pain of other people. Again, are we there? Things are going okay with us. We're fine. But our hearts are broken when we look at others that are not doing well. Because then we are modeling the heart of God for others. If we're doing that, he will use us to be change agents. Nehemiah has it. When he hears about Jerusalem, he sits down and weeps. What's another growth opportunity? Again, this is not a great word to think about. But we're going to have some desert experiences in our lives. I mentioned in the first service, and they got a kick out of this. I wish I could have added in my outline, in my message, just one S to that word desert and say, would you like dessert? <laughs> uh, you'll have that after lunch today, so hang in there. You'll have that. But what about deserts, dry times? Jesus had it. If our Savior went through it, will we be willing to as well? Look at Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. It's not accidental that we have this part of his life in the Scriptures for us because the desert will come for us as well. And the key is, will we be ready for it? It's a dry time. It can be a lonely time. It can seem so unproductive. We have so many examples through the Bible of people who went through desert experiences. How about Moses? Literally out in the desert. Not just a spiritual desert experience, but he was out there. He had to learn a lesson. What was that lesson? He had to learn how to lead God's way instead of trying to do it his own way. Do you remember what he did? When one of his fellow Israelites was not being treated well by an Egyptian in captivity, Moses killed the Egyptian. Killed him. That's not what God would have wanted him to do. That was not God's plan. Think about that as the way to free the Israelites. What if he had decided, well, the only way to do it is to kill an Egyptian one at a time? He'd probably still be working on it today. There's so many of them. He tried to do it his own way. Paul also spent time in the desert. In Galatians 1, we read some of the story of that. He spent three years of spiritual preparation and discipleship time in Arabia. A literal desert experience physically, but even more spiritually. Because what did Saul learn? He had a great passion for God before he became a follower of Jesus. But he didn't have the full picture of the truth until that road to Damascus when Jesus revealed himself to him. And that's when Paul learned a great lesson in the discipleship process. Yes, we need to be passionate, but we need to be passionate about the truth. And folks, we have access to the truth. Jesus Christ, I hope you're passionate about that message because it is the greatest story. Joseph, you remember him back in the Old Testament again? Betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery. And while he's in prison, can you imagine a question he must have been asking along the way? God, have you forgotten where I am? I'm in this prison. When am I going to get out? And eventually it happened, but he went through that time, a desert time. And one more on the list. John, back in the New Covenant, the apostle, exiled on the island of Patmos. He had to stay there for this long period of time. Can you imagine what that would have been like for him? I'm sure that he would have been asking the question, God, have you forgotten where I am? What's going to change? Oh, I'm so thankful God used him in that time because do you remember what he brought to us? During that time on the island, God gave him a revelation of the new Jerusalem what heaven would be like. And as a result of that, he was able to give us that picture in the book of Revelation. 
the revelation about Christ, which includes the revelation of heaven on the way. God used that desert experience to help so many. That may happen for you. We don't know how long that's going to be. You may be going through a desert experience right now. How long? For Nehemiah, he waited four months before he ended up going to Jerusalem. How about Moses? Remember how long he was in the desert? 40 years. So we don't know how long it's going to be, but it won't be wasted if you and I will look for redemption from God. There's a purpose in that. He is growing us, strengthening us, preparing us for the future. And here's a third spiritual growth opportunity that's so exciting. In these tough times of waiting, during that time, we can trust that God is in control and he is at work. God is at work in the desert times, in these times when we are isolated. God is at work now in this pandemic, I believe. It is so crazy to see all the things that happening, are happening, but by faith I'm saying, God, I cannot wait to see what you're going to unveil. I cannot wait to see part of your plan unfold during this time and that there will be renewal like never before. That's what I'm praying about. I hope you'll join me in that. Isaiah 30, verse 15. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. We're promised this in the old covenant. God is at work, invisibly and powerfully. He is sovereign. He is powerful. What is happening in Nehemiah's situation? God is at work in the lives of others, like King Artaxerxes, who is Nehemiah's boss and the king of the area. So when Nehemiah realizes it's time to go, that four-month period is over, what does he do? He goes up to the king and he says, hey, king, can I have a little sabbatical? Can I take a break from work? Can I go? He probably had no idea what the king would say. The king said, yeah, man, take your time and go. And not only can you have time off, but I'm going to give you some financial resources that you can help in the rebuilding of the wall. God was working during that time in lives, and that's what he'll do for us as well. He'll be mobilizing others to share resources. We need to take on the role of what I call, that comes from the Bible, being a watchman. Or ladies, being a watchwoman. I want you to hear from Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6, that refer to this. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. And then that same phrase is repeated at the end of that verse. More than watchmen wait for the morning. What did watchmen do? They guarded the city. They protected the city against people who were trying to attack people there. And they would have different assignments. Some of them would be there during the daytime, which they liked a lot better than having to be there overnight. Because the watchmen then would be concerned. You know, they didn't have the lights that we have today. Are we going to be attacked at night? We won't even be able to see the enemy coming. And I could just hear them saying, Lord, please bring the dawn as quick as possible. But the dawn coming didn't speed up. That was up to God. I was thinking about that this morning because I woke up about four in the morning, got up and began looking over my message, praying, preparing for this time a little bit, and it was pitch black. But eventually, at that appropriate time in the six o'clock range, the light began to come. You see, God's in control. He is in charge. The watchmen knew they couldn't make the light come. They just had to wait patiently and be prepared for that time. Let's you and I look that way. Let's always be looking for the light of the gospel. Let's trust God in his plan and sovereignty, even when we have to wait. I had read a kind of a funny story about this that I want to share with you about the waiting process. And it didn't really happen. This is a made-up story, okay? 
but it's based on 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, a verse you've probably heard a lot. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a what? Thousand years. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So a man was hearing that verse, and he was really interested a lot more in money. So here is what he said after he got very excited about it. He spoke to God and said, Lord, is it true that a thousand years for us is just like a minute to you? And God said, yes. And so this money-hungry guy continued on and said, then a million dollars to us must be like a penny to you. And in this story, God said, yes. So the man said, Lord, would you give me one of those pennies? And God said, all right, wait here just a minute. <laughs> a thousand years for that to come. Hey, in just a moment, I'm going to share with you one more powerful principle about waiting. But I cannot tell you how excited I am to be able to introduce to you a couple who are here today who have been serving on the mission field for 26 years in an unreached country. And we've had the privilege of being able to host them next door in the mission house. I've had a chance to meet them and their daughter and have some wonderful fellowship time with them. And all I'm going to tell you is their first names, and they're going to come and share with you some things that I believe will be so encouraging to you, but also a reminder that we're in a world situation where we need to be praying for the front lines more than ever before. So Dan and Carol are with us. Why don't you join me in welcoming them as they come and share here today. Good to have you. Good morning. It's so good to see faces here after living next door for almost three weeks. Um, we just read a text about Nehemiah. He heard bad news from home. And he sat down and he wept and mourned and grieved. Between hearing bad news and seeing what God's going to do is a painful time. And sometimes that lasts for a long time before we know what God's going to do. Sometimes we don't see it in this life. We've been in that time for the last six months. I know many of you feel that way. Um, we have been serving overseas for, in Asia for 26 years. And in January, we packed up a little bag and went to go to meetings in a nearby country. Um, having no idea that we wouldn't be back. We landed, and uh, shortly after we arrived to the places where our meetings were, um, COVID became very public in China, and the borders closed, and flights were canceled. Our return flights were canceled. And we and many of our colleagues were suddenly shut out of what is our home. We were put in hastily assembled living quarters. We're thankful for the people, all of you, who provide for us through the um, IMB. And um, we're just sitting there wondering what's next, how long before we can go home. Well, after about another month of waiting, we received more bad news. The situation, political situation where we were serving is uh, deteriorating. And because of some incidences related to that, we were told, you're not going back. Not all of us, but many of us were told that. Um, suddenly, it was actually hard to even comprehend. We had just left for a meeting. We were supposed to be gone a few weeks, and suddenly we're told, you're not going back to your home, to your friends, to your church, to your ministry, to the life you've had for all these years. And that began the time for grieving, just like Nehemiah, to sit and weep day after day, me a lot more than him. <laughs> So many questions to ask God. Will we ever see our friends again in this world? Are they going to face more persecution than they have before? Will the church be able to stand and make it through these times? And then what about us? What, where are we going to live? What are we going to do? And how are we 
going to continue to see God's word progress to the nations in times like this, especially where our hearts were to that nation. So it was a dark and a difficult time, and we're still waiting for most of those answers. We still don't know. We're thankful we have a place here to, to pray and feel God's presence as we wait. But one thing I've seen, in, even in my own life, that just like Pastor Scott said, um, these times of waiting are not wasted. Some things that God is doing in me, one is just when um, it felt like the foundation was just totally shaken, like an earthquake, and the only thing still under my feet was God's word. And there were times I felt like just gasping for breath and, you know, the water's getting higher, but it was always a life ring. God's word was a life ring, offering hope. And also making sense out of this world because it doesn't make sense apart from God's word. Another word is surrender. Sometimes it takes all of our desires, plans, and wants to be totally erased and eliminated before we can say again. We said it before, but again, okay, God, not my will, your will. Whatever that is, I have no idea what's next. Let your will be done. And another one is just... Um, God, there's a time for in grieving to count your losses and to name those losses, it helps. But to come to the place where I can stop thinking about our losses and think about the one thing that cannot be lost, and that's Christ. There's still more that we could lose, but instead, now I know I can always say, but I still have Christ. So I'm very thankful that God is teaching us still in these hard times of waiting and still weeping. So we have been walking through some hard times in the last uh, several months, and yet, just as Pastor Scott is bringing the message today, through those hard times, we find God is still at work. And so while we're waiting, we're also watching. Often when we go through those hard times, we ask ourselves, what's going on, God? Why is this happening? And, and maybe you've asked that about the, the coronavirus and all the implications it's had here. We certainly ask those questions. Why is all of this happening at this time? Why is 2020 such a, 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 a cataclysmic year? When I go through those times, and as we've gone through those times in these recent months, I turn and I remember the words of Jesus in John 5:17 when he said, my father is still at work and I am still working. When we go through those hard times, the first thing I try to do is remember God is still with me. He's the God who's always with us. He's the good Father, as, as we sang earlier today. God is good. And even though the situation may be hard, I pause and reflect and remember on God's goodness, that he's walking with us, and he's at work around us. And so the question becomes, what am I looking for? Am I watching and seeing what God is doing? And that can be difficult because we don't always see clearly what God's doing. So in my life, that often leads me to prayer. And this time has been uh, uh, weeks and weeks of going to the Lord in prayer and praying for eyes to see and ears to hear what he's doing. Uh, and at the same time, to be looking in our world, to be reading the newspapers, uh, now it's internet. Or, or watching the, the news on TV. What's happening out there? Uh, Charles Spurgeon said in the morning you should open your Bible and open your newspaper and then interpret the newspaper by your Bible. Trying to do that, talking to mission colleagues. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? To national partners back in Asia. What's happening on the ground? What's happening in the churches there? To try to put together as best I can, what is God doing in our world today? And how do we need to respond? We don't have the answers yet, but I go to God with gratitude and not just with questions. For he is good and he is working. And in time, he'll show that to us for our situation, I'm sure to you for your situations. We don't have time to go into all the stories today. Uh, we would love to share them with you. We're living in the little house right over there. Feel free to come by any time or, or to, to reach out to us while we're here. We would love to uh, share with you all that the Lord is doing in Asia. Okay. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. 
I know that part of the purpose of some of the challenges that were shared here in their testimony is we have had the privilege of crossing paths with them. And we want to open that up to you as well. We hope you'll reach out. Take some time. Those of you that are involved in Sunday school classes, maybe you could invite Dan and Carol to come and share um, a message sometime and to hear some of those stories. You will hear about the work of God in an unreached part of the world. And, and my dream is that all the people there in that country will still get to hear the gospel. God is at work. And pray for them, would you? Pray for the next open door. Whatever God has in store, we know that his will for their lives is going to move forward, and we cannot wait to hear what that's going to be for them also. And I want to encourage you, and this is the last point to share in this message, as you wait, as you wait on the Lord, what will happen? You will become stronger spiritually. If you're waiting in the right way, again, not being passive spiritually, but waiting to hear from him, waiting for his will to be unveiled, waiting for him to show you his plan for the future. What are we promised? We can mount up with wings like eagles. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. You know, birds are everywhere. I know you probably enjoy them. You enjoy seeing them flap their wings and flying. But do you realize how powerful eagles are? It's interesting, this illustration that God has used in his word. They are able to soar. Their wings are so strong that they can actually connect with warm air currents that are rising up from the planet, going up into the sky. These are thermal winds, powerful winds, and they just go straight up. And once the eagles connect with them, they don't have to flap their wings anymore. They just soar. And some of them have actually been monitored at flying, soaring 80 miles an hour through these winds. That is movement, isn't it? That's the picture we have spiritually of what will happen when we wait on the Lord, when we trust his spiritual thermal power in our lives to help us to take off, to fly, to be faithful to him without having to flap our own weak wings, right? But instead to trust in him. And as we wait on him, he moves us into his plan and to his power. And as we move forward, what are we to do? It's very clear. Make sure he's the one known. Make sure he's the one who gets the recognition and the credit. Don't draw it to self at all. May his name be glorified. And as a result of that, that people will hear about the gospel, that they will become followers of Jesus, that they will become disciples of Christ, and then they will all be sent out to serve and to share. That is God's will and desire. Jesus' name to be known and glorified, people to become part of his family, and then to grow spiritually stronger, and then to be sent out to serve and to share. So what has God said to you today about the waiting process? Easy? No. Fun? Not at all. Life-changing? Absolutely. When we're waiting with the Lord and on the Lord, with the goal for his name to be known and for lives to be eternally changed.